Hey everybody, final thoughts time for Lost Explorers, which is from designer Cedric Chebusi, who made a big name for himself back in like, I don't know, 2012 or 2013, when he put out um, Lewis and Clark, which to this day is still one of the coolest fusions of deck hand management and racing and beautiful production and really great history that comes to life. And I mean, it, it was a really, really big deal. And I mean, I think it's still a fantastic game. But ever since then, Cedric has really been focusing on much lighter fare. Uh, you know, games that are quicker, easier to play, and Lost Explorers is definitely one of those. It's very light, very fast. Every turn, it's a worker placement game at heart. You've got at potentially three, maybe four workers, depending on how you evolve, and you split them between gathering the resources you need to um, be able to send them out to various places in the world so you can score points. And there's a couple of interesting things about it. One is the resources themselves. Every time you are going to get one of these, you have to make a choice blind as to whether you're going to take it as a vehicle or as another mission to score more points. And that is an incredibly important decision with a surprising amount that goes into it because you've got to consider, right, okay, I know this is a green. I know that means it's going to be somewhere on this side of the world. I know it means I'm going to need a lot of green blimps. Okay, with that in mind, should I take it on? I also know it's going to let me move up this progress track instead of that progress track. All that combination of stuff helps me decide if I should take a gamble and find out that, yep, I need to go to China and Australia to complete this one. Or do I just take it? Because the tricky thing is, every time you get one of these, uh, you know, every time you take a green disc and you make it a green mission, that's one less green disc, a blimp, that you could use to actually complete the mission. So there's always compromises with every step. And once you actually decide, okay, well, I've got the vehicles I need to send them out there, which of these am I going to jettison? Because one of them has to go into a public discard pile that other people could potentially pull stuff out of. You might be able to as well later, but um, you're constantly losing these things. But more importantly, which ones do you keep? Because those can set yourself up for the other elements in a mission or another mission or a potential future mission you might get. Because that's the other thing about this game. The makeup of this box is such that you can see all of the, uh, you can see the color of all the upcoming chips. So you know what types of vehicles and missions you might be able to get. But of course, you're just one player drafting these. And if somebody else gets to it, you might, oh, that's all the one card you didn't. Oh, now all the other cards are buried way deep. How am I going to get that car? Which is why, if you want to get something quicker, don't just send one person to the archive to get whatever's on top. Send three so you can dig three down and get that one that's absolutely crucial for your success before somebody else snags it. These are the kinds of things you have to consider step by step by step. And it's not over. Once the mission is um, set up and you've got all your people, and you're like, yay, I got some points. Oh, thank heavens. And um, I've had to give up my vehicles do it. Now, one of these has to come off the board because they've got to report back to HQ, which means you're still leaving other ones on the board. But you might need those ones to go back to the archive. Do you have another mission that's going to take advantage of them? Or, more importantly, in this interactive part element of the game, do you leave them on there because you know somebody else wants to go there and they will inevitably bump you out which means they've got to give you vehicles that maybe you need um, because you can't get them any other way. There's a lot, a surprising amount of hidden depth in this game. On the surface, it looks so simple. Just send your workers, get some chips. Once you've got the right chips, put them out there, score some points. And you could play it on a really simple, you know, like top, le top surface level game like that. But there is a lot more to consider because this is a race. Just like going all the way back to Lewis and Clark, uh, his first game. And smart play is about more than just doing the obvious thing, but planning uh, further ahead. And the game gives you the tools to do that. So I really like all of this quite a bit. Now, stuff I don't like, as has been mentioned elsewhere, it's definitely the case that there are some production issues with it. Um, you know, looking at them right now, you could probably tell the difference between this blue and green, but during the run through, when you're doing an overhead view and you can only see a little bit of them, sometimes, well, what's the green and what's the blue now? They're both pretty similar. Now, I have found that's not so much a problem if you're playing in a very bright room, but it is a shame that this blue and green are so similar. But even more so, I know a lot of people are very unhappy with um, the notion that as you take more and more tiles out, 
out, the other ones that remain, um, they, they don't stay splayed out. They just start slipping down and falling and making a mess, which is why it's absolutely essential that if you play this game, you've got something heavy that you can put in there to keep them. Like, like I'm you know, trying to put books on a bookshelf. You need that book in. It's a shame the game didn't come with something. Now, you could use little glass, uh, you know, uh, contraptions like what my wife makes for me, but you could just use a few dice. Just like a really big die could go in there as well to hold them in place. It's, it's, it's a solvable problem, but it is a legitimate one. I have seen some people complain too about having a hard time with the icons. I never really thought it was an issue at all because one, most of the time I don't really need to look at the board. My mission tells me all the icons. It's right there telling me exactly what I need. Color coded. The only reason I need to look at the board is, oh, is somebody else there? Now I got to decide, am I going to wait for that person to leave? Because eventually they're going to pull out because they got to do a mission somewhere else. Or am I going to have to bump them? Um, and the thing is, I I mean, I guess I still again, wait, wait, which is the, okay, oh, that, they all, because they're all little, you know, just kind of dark icons like that. Again, I don't have a problem with it because I don't think of them as icons. I think of them as the places in the world. This is an African tribal mass. This is, I think it's Ganesha. This is the the Great Wall of China. This is a gondola in Italy. Um, this is a statue in Tibet, I think. It's a real shame, and I mentioned this in the run-through, that the developers didn't help with the playability of this game. They put the work in. They've done the research. They, they know where all these uh, real world places are, but I mean, I'm guessing that this is um, a, a statue. Game. I'm really not 100% certain. And I could go and do my own research, but they did the research. Why? I mean, this this QR code is fun. It's a neat little fun gadget and gimmick, but I would have much rather had, one, just a summary of how the game works, and two, a little bit of history of all these places in the world, because I have found um, I don't have a hard time. When I look at this, artifact, I know this is Tibet, um, Italy, and I don't have to... Like, wait, let me try and match symbols here and there. And so... I mean, again, if they're, they're, the tools are here that you need, I mean, granted, you do need something heavy. Um, you know, again, uh, check out my wife's uh, line of uh, glass game accessories at www.gamerglass.art. Um, you know, they are one possible way to do it. But again, just some heavy dice will do it as well. Um, or poker chips or just about anything. It's not really that tough. So there, there's... There's more going on here than meets the eye. And we definitely enjoyed it. Um, I... It is interesting, though, because in spite of all my talk about how there, there's a lot going on here, once you've kind of got it, once you've started to see the mass nations, um, you know, for us, as a two-player game, it kind of becomes very quickly uh, kind of a... Road, okay, let, I, I know how this is going to play out. I know where you're going to go. I know where I'm going to go. And in large part, that's because as a two-player game, the board tightening mechanism is these things. There are four locations in a two-player game that nobody ever has to go to. They're just automatically taken care of. And that works to tighten up the board. Um, but it doesn't work as well to engender the feeling I assume you'd get at a higher player count when there are more players moving in and bumping each other and like, okay, okay, is anybody going to bump me out of Africa? You know, I mean, maybe I don't want to go here because I want to stay there because somebody else, oh, nobody's going to go. Maybe this is the one I should pull out. As a two-player game where there's generally only three or four missions to keep track of and, um, you know, half of the board is just gone and, um, you know, there's still going to be opportunities to bump each other and whatnot. But again... It's very easy to game out exactly how things are going to play out, right? Okay, I know I should or I shouldn't. I mean, so I think this game is going to be a lot more interesting where you have that um, that confounding element of other human players. Oh my gosh, I didn't think you were going to go there now. You actually bumped me out before, but you did give me this chip. That means I could do this whole other thing now. Maybe I should go ahead and research and get a train because you just gave me the other train I needed. No, whatever this is, it's going to work. And really, I wanted to do a red anyway. Um, because I didn't think you were going to bump me out. I thought you were going to go. The more unpredictability... Now, that means, I would imagine, again, having not played this as a more than two-player game, where it's very strategic, like almost too much so that you can just work everything out. At a higher player count, I think it's going to get much more tactical as people are jumping in and moving each other around, and it's hard to keep track of what everybody's prioritizing at a given point, while, of course, at the same time, everybody is racing, racing, racing. Um, I think the game is really going to come alive more then and be more exciting. I mean... It's implicit. A race is more fun with more than one person against whom you are racing. And so that's really my only problem with Lost Explorers. Yes, there are some production issues. We didn't find them to be too terribly daunting. Um, and I, I do really like the constant 
um, d decisions of every time I get something done, I have to abandon things. And often I have to give them directly to my opponents. And so that um, thought process is great. I would love to see it at a higher player count, but I did still enjoy my time with Lost Explorers. And that is the run-through, folks. Thanks so much for watching. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.